Um, we're going to hear from Herbert Hickman in uh, for a group of um, four guys uh, on a paper about um, clinical trials and the usage of, usage of tech in order to produce the documents for good choices on clinical trials. Hubert is a senior staff software engineer at SX Management and he has worked for the last 30 years on uh, uh, medical and research informatics, um, mostly doing, doing um, transplantation of organs, neonatology, orthopedics, neurology, you name it. And, um, and this particular work has to do with um, finding volunteers for um, for clinical trials, um, good patients for clinical trials on um, matching patients on clinical trials for, can for cancer. Uh, so with you, I have the floor. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Let me uh, share my screen here. Make sure I share the right thing. Okay, so uh, I would like to thank uh, the the tech group uh, Tug uh, for accepting this talk. Uh, it's a maybe a little bit you, you know different than many of the talks because we are not. Uh, down in the, the weeds and the, and the details of law tech, you know, like some of the, the talks are, and, and we're we're using law tech as a as a tool as one part of this uh, very large problem of clinical trial search, uh, and so we our use of it is as a PDF generator uh, for to generate a nice uh, PDF document, and the the, the team that uh, has contributed to this from Essex is myself. I'm the technical lead. Matt Mariano is the back end engineer. Hai Ben Wu is the, the uh, cloud engineer. And Hong Da Chung is the uh, front end engineer. And we will talk about clinical trial search uh, a little bit, the introduction of that, uh, a very small bit about the company, and then our use of LawTech the challenges we faced, what we used and what helped, and, and what we have working now, and how it's deployed, and you know what eventually we would like to do with this. So this, this small piece of this very large clinical trial search space uh, is, is solved with LaTeX. Um, but I will say this before we jump in, you know, there's a lot of resources that I, I will show here. So there's uh, a lot of people have been working in many different areas within the clinical trial search space. And, you know, we are building on the things that many of those have, have built before us in terms of the ability to do these searches. And, you know, it's combined with some good science as well. And, uh, and with that, uh, let's take a look. So Essex is a, um, we are a consulting company primarily. Uh, and there's the three main areas, as we see on the screen, the clinical trials uh, solutions, which um, this is one of the things that the, the company is doing in the, in the clinical trial space. There's also the reporting, the CTRP, clinical trials reporting program, clinicaltrials.gov, semantics and data standards. And this is another area that I work uh, in, in terms of uh, interoperability, uh, and standards, ontologies, um, you know, all of the things, you know, if you've worked in the semantic web in the past, or if you use OWL files, um, there's a lot of those in medicine and in research informatics, and they can be very useful uh, uh, to, to use in, in various problem applications. There's also standards for uh, submission of study data, trial data, all of those things. So it, it's, it's, you know, again, kind of a complex world we live in, in the, in the research world and, you know, the work we do uh, on behalf of NCI and others uh, to help automate, streamline, manage all of the things that is part of just the, you know, day-to-day -day effort uh, in, in the research community, you know, to us, to, 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 
you know, people wonder how simple are these things, and none of these things are simple. There's there's complexity in in most everything that we do in this space. And then there's the provision of medicine informatics and the omics analysis, biomarkers, uh, proteomics, genomics, all of these things that are becoming more and more helpful as, as, as treatments get targeted towards particular you know, cancer types and the, the biomarkers within a particular patient, you know, that they have a, a cancer of a particular type. Uh, I'm not a clinician, I'm a computer scientist, but uh, having been in the area, you know, for a number, you know, 30 years or so in research and, uh, and clinical informatics, uh, you start getting a understanding about how, you know, how all the pieces fit together. And hopefully, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if we as a company have done our job right, uh, we actually make a difference. And so some patient, you know, can get enrolled in a trial, study data is done properly. So new treatments can be approved that, that actually, you know, that, that work well for types of cancers, you know, keeping up with all of those things, you know, it's all a, it's, it's a very sort of organic uh, set of processes that, that leads us along. Uh, these are some of the companies and institutes that we work with, the NIH, and the National Cancer Institute is part of the National Institutes of Health, LIDOS, uh, NYU, uh, you know, just dot, 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 a number of these different areas. So, so this is our domain that, that you see on the screen here. And you know, the, uh, it's kind of a wide variety in both sort of breadth and depth of the things that we do. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's good work. Um, so a bit of history. Um, so uh, I've been writing code since for a living since 1982. It's been a long time. I think in September, it'll be 40 years in the business. Um, so uh, quite a long time. Uh, I was first exposed to tech 87 or 88, I think, um, and in grad school and started using it for papers like many like many people did you, you know you, you you come across a thing and it you can write your papers in it and it was much better than TROF or NROF or you know the 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 word processors of the day that existed then and uh, that use uh, continued i've had a couple of stints of of teaching computer science uh, and both of those instances I have used uh, LaTeX um, to, you know, class notes and, and exams and this, that, and the other thing, all the things that you do as part of teaching. Uh, and the, the unusual thing is that, you know, there, there's two sort of moments where LaTeX has, has uh, intersected with some of the use that we've got uh, in, in my, in, in the med in the in the informatics community, one part the, the originally in the early '90s, uh, it was we used it to generate uh, patient summary reports for organ transplant recipients, and you know they had a we replaced a um, uh, if you can imagine a a three foot you know wide card stock uh, flow sheet which had handwritten labs and meds and notes and this sort of thing on it. And we used LaTeX to make a computerized kind of a version of that. And it was really popular for quite a number of years. It's, it's not used anymore. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I will tell this story because sometimes you see you know, how we, the things we use as tools do make differences. I was at a, a, a trade show uh, sometime in the late 90s. And we had our competitors, you know, the company that, that I was uh, working for. Uh, we had our booth and, you know, we had our stuff. And then one of our competitors came over to talk to us and she had a folder, you know, this is before you know, electronic medical records and everything. She had a folder that was full of patient summary reports generated by our software, the patient summary report that I had written uh, back in the day. Uh, using LaTeX to typeset. And she had a child who was a pediatric kidney transplant recipient 
at at that time Children's Hospital of Atlanta, I think, or, or somewhere that was their customer, uh, but uh, you know her kid, and so it was a little bit unusual that your competitor comes with a vanilla folder full of her child's medical records that she carried everywhere with her because that's how you did it in you know 1998 or 99 or so so that was one use and then the, the second use is the one that that we will show today and it is a it is a use within the clinical trial search space as a as a component of the software and in much you know kind of in a in a modern architectural sense uh, the first thing about clinical trial searching, uh, number one, it is not easy. If anybody tells you it's an easy field, it is not. Um, it is it is complicated. Medicine is complicated. Um, it's you, you, we we try to think of medicine as some type of uh, pure science or engineering, but it's not exactly that. Um, it is you know somewhat reactive you know it is somewhat inexact we think this might help you or you're not the best match for this treatment but you know you, you can be on this trial we think it might help you there's sort of very large studies that are looking at tumors in general so it, and matches are based on many things you know the disease type the type of cancer you have biomarker information you know if if you everyone knows somebody you know, cancer touches every family, um, so everybody knows somebody if, who has cancer or has survived cancer or passed away from cancer. Um, but you may know the, the, you'll know the type of disease, you may know the biomarkers, you know, I'm HER2 new positive or I'm EGFR positive, you'll know what treatments you may have. And then the other thing, if you're looking for a trial is, you know, things like geolocation. Where do you want to go for your treatment? How far can you drive? Um, some people can go long distances to enroll in a, in a trial. Some people are not able to do that. So it is a, a, a combination of, of many things, both you know, internal to the patient, like the disease and biomarkers and the external, what things are available, what studies are a good match for you. And for those that are, are you somewhere where you can go you know, enroll in the study receive a study drug or placebo and 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 you know see what the studies see what the trial does sometimes trials do not work sometimes trials work very well and there's success stories that you read you know as medicines you know as as treatments are put through trials about you know the ones that work well sometimes they work really well so um, but you know to give patients that opportunity if they're looking for a trial. So what we're going to show today, and I will demo towards the end, uh, is called MFACT. Uh, it is a, a focus search. It is cancer specific. There are trials for all kinds of things uh, out there, but we are concentrating on cancer trials. It's, it's our area. Uh, there are some cancer specific terminology and curation that we do uh, in, inside MFACT. Uh, it looks for open trials only, so you know, we, we've got, because of the available data, we've got up-to-date site information, so it doesn't do you any good to show you, here's a really great trial for you, but the place you want to go to is full. They're no longer enrolling patients. That's, that's not going to help. And so, you know, all of these things combine, you know, within the, the, um, within the system, to try to match the patients to a, a manageable number of trials. You know, the, on any given day in the cancer space, there's about 4,400 uh, open treatment trials with sites that are actively recruiting patients. And this, you know, that's our sort of domain to pick from and to search through uh, as we're as we're doing our clinical trial searching for the patients. Um, data sources. Where does this stuff come from and how do you how do you uh, how do you do it? So 
you know, there's a couple of data sources, and I will go back to the first slide too. So one is the NCIT, as we call it, the NCI thesaurus, the National Cancer Center thesaurus. Uh, it's about 175,000 concepts. Um, it is, it, and let's just go look. Uh, let me bring over a window. And so that, so that we can look at this thing. So it is from the NCI via the National Institutes of Health. It's open, it's public. You can go download it uh, and do what you wish with it. You know, the downloads are right there if you want to go look. But if we go look at something like non-small cell lung cancer, and then we will get a code. And it's what this tells us, you know, so this ontology that I'm showing you, uh, it's one of the main uh, data sources that we use. And it is a uh, it is a, a cyclic digraph. It is a directed graph, as these uh, ontologies are. And you know it it has within the ontology, okay, a lot of information that we and we use a, a good bit of this in our clinical trial searching. You know, it's lung non small non small cell carcinoma. It gives you a definition of the term. It tells you all the different synonyms. Uh, that are there, where things came from, what the parent uh, terms are. You know, so if you go up in our hierarchy, it's it is a type of lung cancer. It's a type of non-small cell cancer as well. Uh, and then you can go down to the child concepts. And you know, as you go down the the graph, you you get more and more detailed at the at the type of disease. But then you've got other interesting bits uh, in this ontology too. You know, that tells you you know, what kind of molecular abnormality it may have, you know, the different, uh, you know, gene mutations that, that may happen, and then places where it's used, you know, different drugs that may be used for this type of cancer, et cetera. So th there's a lot of things that exist within these ontologies, and I will just do one more thing, and then we will get back uh, to the presentation, but if you open it up, you can kind of get an idea of what this hierarchy looks like, you know. So as you can tell, this is just, you know, looking at lung cancers, you know, down this part of the graph, you know, it's very detailed, very granular. So, you know, in, in our work, we, we do a lot of work uh, with the NCIT uh, and it is a you know a big part of what the the search engine uses. One of the things that the search engines use it. So it's a digraph, and I just want to say a couple of things about it because if there's mathematicians in the audience, or if there's graph theory people, you know there's about 175,000 concepts within the NCIT. One of those is non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, if you do an operation to take the transitive closure so we can actually do these graph operations in the background that we will demonstrate. Um, there's about 1.4 million rows in the transitive closure table uh, for the NCIT. And there's well over 4 million distinct paths within the NCIT digraph that we use. And we do some traversing of the graph uh, in our matching operations as well. But uh, every time when you see the demo and I, I hit the button to do a search, uh, within, you know, that search will take hopefully about 10 seconds to do a search. And there's at least 6,000 operations that happen in that 10 seconds against the transitive closure table. So, you know, if, if you're a mathematician and you're, you're teaching and you get to teach graph theory or discrete math, uh, you can you know, tell the students that, yes, the transitive closure table is used. Uh, it's not just a, a thing you study on a particular day in your in your coursework. So um, sometimes those things, yeah, you know, sometimes things that you did in a graph theory world come back and become the very thing you need uh, to make to make something actually work in a timely manner. So so the next slide, let's go. So the other data source is the the CTS APIs, we call it the Cancer Clinical Trial Search uh, API. And if we if we look at the, the CTS API, uh, it is a 
it is another API that you can sign up to use. You can request a license to use it. It is supported by the National Cancer Institute, uh, just like the NCIT is. Uh, but it is a, a RESTful API. And you know, if you, you do the web calls these days to get things, you know, if we go look, uh, we can actually uh, scroll down and look at the what what the API build looks like. Uh, and you get an idea. Now you have to have an API key, but you can just apply and get one, uh, tell the Cancer Institute what you need it for. And so this is a big component of our search. You know, so there's a get trials, you can get, and this is where much, much of our, our searching happens in this RESTful API. <clears throat> Not everything we do is in there. We do additional things, but there is a, in a, a RESTful API that very much helps um, support this effort. Uh, and, you know, you can play, you know, if you're a developer and you use RESTful APIs and you've used Postman or other things to, to do calls, this is exactly that kind of thing. So those are our two main data sources um, for what we add. And in this, the CTS API, because of the kind of data that's in there, it is the primary data source for the PDF report generation. So when the PDF reports gets generated, as we'll show in a minute, there's a Python script that goes out, calls the RESTful APIs, gets this data back down, generates a LaTeX file, typesets the LaTeX, returns it to the client. Um, and you know, you've got yourself a nice PDF report uh, based upon that. Uh, the MFACT architecture itself is, uh, it's deployed in AWS, um, it's Amazon Web Services, there's a lot of deployments in the cloud these days, um, it's modern serverless architecture, there's a GUI front end, the back end is Amazon uh, AWS Lambda functions, if you're not familiar with Lambda functions, um, you can think of them as not a you know, virtual computer in the cloud that you can go log into and do things, but there's a function call that you can make that exists out in the cloud uh, that you can make that function call and you can get data back from that function call. And, you know, that Lambda lives on a container that AWS spins up for you. They're sort of meant to be lightweight, low cost uh, things to do uh, computation in the cloud of various sorts. And there's also ETLs uh, that are deployed, uh, you know, in in AWS as well, that runs as these Lambda functions. And they they do our housekeeping things like doing some of our pre-processing for all the clinical trials, doing some some operations with the NCIT when that version changes. So when, when the National Cancer Institute publishes a new version of the NCIT, there's back-end processes that will go down, download that version, compute that transitive closure table, path enumeration, and a number of other things that we do uh, to, to make all the bits and pieces work. The back-end is, is just Amazon Aurora uh, RDS. Um, so it is a Postgres database, a Postgres flavor. It's not Postgres, Postgres, but it is Postgres. Um, and it works in the same way, even our database is serverless. So our database, if nobody is logged into the application, the database spins down uh, to become idle. Um, and then it spins back up when it needs to. So, you know, we're not spending AWS money if nobody is using the application. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos has enough boats or spaceships or whatever, but anyway, you know, as part of the, the head of Amazon, but, you know, it saves us, it optimizes what we need to spend as a company, you know, we're not, it's not taking up resources um, when we're not using it, and it can also scale up and down as needed. Um, this is from our cloud architect, I cannot draw these diagrams, uh, but this is a, a diagram of what the architecture looks like in AWS, and, you know, if you look at these various bits, uh, over here, uh, you know, we, we do user authentication. There, there's some, the, the interesting bits are here, you know, here's our database. Um, 
here's the CTS API, here's the NCI thesaurus that we download and process into our database. One of these little Lambda things here is the LaTeX Lambda. So it's probably this one, probably. It's not labeled, but this is the function that generates the report. There's lots of Lambdas that we have, probably several dozen different Lambdas, but one of these Lambdas in one of these boxes is our LaTeX Lambda. And it generates the, the report and sends it back to the users. Um, well-architected framework, auto-scaling. You know, the, the other thing that we do is we have, we auto-deploy. So some people still you know, sort of manually put stuff out there on AWS, but, you know, as part of our development processes, we use the cloud development toolkit um, to, to do these automated deployments out to AWS. So if we tweak something in a container or in a bits of code and we deploy, all that redeployment happens automatically, and you know the users never know that the, um, the that they they've got it. Well, and I say see new features. Yeah, you know, these things happen seamlessly behind the scenes, and AWS manages all of this deployment for all of these things, both the things that serve application, part of the daily jobs that run that do this, and you know there's other things, zero trust policy, bastionless setup. You know, there's signed deployment package, all the things you're supposed to do uh, in a cloud deployment, uh, we we are doing. So um, that's, the, that's you know, in our team, that's Hyben's role uh, to do the cloud engineering. And for the most part, this works very well. Um, the, the infrastructure works uh, as designed and all the bits and pieces uh, fit together. Okay. So I'm at a LaTeX conference, um, and where does this fit in? Well, we need a PDF report. And I don't know how many of you have tried to use other things. I've used Report Lab and work, you know, in previous work uh, to generate reports, and it's okay. Uh, there's PDF Tron. I mean, there are a ton of these things to generate PDFs out there. I, there's a lot of them, but a lot of them, come with costs and a lot of them come with limitations for the type of data that we have within these clinical trials. Um, and it depends upon the audience. You, you know, there's a lot of textual information in a clinical protocol uh, and there's a lot of sort of tabular information. And so, you know, as we were thinking about it, me being the, you know, being a tech person, I'm like, oh, Maybe we could make LaTeX do this, you know, because it can type set tables for us. And, you know, you can throw lots of things at it as long as you get, you know, you get your uh, document just so and your installation work is working, then, you know, it can it can do a good job for you. So let me go back for just a second. So it will work, but how do you get it out there? And we didn't start from scratch for sure. Uh, there's a couple of things out there. I think Sam O'Connor, uh, his Lambda Law Tech, and that was, I believe, there was a a tug presentation several years ago uh, on this, or one of these. I forget which one. It may have been Sam, Sam O'Connor's, uh, but but so we had some places to start. Um, so if you go look at these GitHub repos, and I'll do that in a second, you know, you can see kind of what they're up to. But none of those are exactly what we needed, but at least it gave us, hey, here's a really good starting point. You know, so if if we go look at at this repo, um, that you know that that this is yeah, this is Sam, Sam O'Connor's repo. So it is you know, you know, there's an interface, you call it, you know, you you a little lambda thing he using Julia, which that's okay. Uh, so there you you create your zip file with a document, you invoke your lambda, and you get back a base sixty four thing that you decode into a PDF. And so we're doing kind of the same thing, uh, but in LaTeX, and our documents are not directly just sent to this thing as a typesetting service. But we've got a Python function that abstracts this and says, 
here's a list of trials. Here's like some geolocation data. Go generate me a report for this list of trials. And then the Python function, you know, talks to the CTS API and does other things. And we'll look at that code as well and, um, and generates the code. It generates the LaTeX file, which gets typeset. Um, so, but, but this was an excellent starting point because you see some of the, the things, you know, the, the talk prior, uh, you know, people talk about Docker containers for various things. That's the key. You know, you get your container right, uh, then your things will work. You get your container wrong, uh, then, then you've got problems. So how do you make this container do what you need it to do? So, so this one, you know, this one works fine. Um, and for what, you know, the purpose that Sam did it, but there were some issues that, that we faced um, that were a little different. Uh, we also needed, again, just to reiterate with the Cloud Development Kit to do our deployments and to make sure our containers were sort of robustly recreatable because CDK, you know, as, as you follow a development process that has, you know, different branches within a single repo like dev and ant and UAT for user acceptance and prod, ant is integration testing, then each of the, each, each of the times that you merge to these branches from a pull request, um, either from a developer in dev or, or up the chain that you see uh, in the slide here, then each time that makes a redeployment of that contain all the containers, including that LaTeX container. So that thing has got to work every time to deploy that container or else we won't get reports generated. So we had some work to do there. And so part of it is, you know, carefully craft the Docker file. Uh, you need a working LaTeX information. You've got to have this thing created under your CDK control. And it's also the container for the Lambda function that generates the report. You know, in Sam's case, that was a fairly, um, you know, you, you send it tech, you get a thing, you get your PDF back. But in our case, that Lambda function has to be a more complicated thing that's not just a typesetter, uh, but it's also the thing that, that generates the report. So... One problem that we ran into, and I don't know if others have run into this as well, when you're doing all these deployments, you know, and so you're running these, you know, deployments where you developers commit to dev, boom, another deployment happens. Develop, another developer commit, you know, does a merge request, pull request to dev, a de deployment happens. Depending on where you pull your Docker from, uh, you can run into Docker Hub issues if you're pulling that image from Docker Hub. So, uh, one of the things that we ended up doing that was important was pulling from uh, the, the some of the publicly supported uh, images for Amazon. And if I can find my cursor, and let me see. Not that when I have this in a window, I just want to show this. Oops, not that. Maybe I don't know this. No, I, I don't have it somewhere or do, but I will look for it in a minute. So, you know, this is a public, the, the public ECR AWS, these are publicly supported by AWS. So when you build from that, you don't have to worry about Docker Hub. So that was one of the lessons. And then um, install what we need and prime the pump. So let's actually look at our Docker file. Let me pull this up. So let me pull up PY charm. Let's use the source, Luke. Whoops. That's not what I wanted. Let me do that. Okay, so now we're back in front of the slide. Okay, so if we look at our Docker file, uh, and this looks, you, you can tell we started with Sam O'Connor's file, but you know we did some different things with it. Um, we've got some, some logos in there. 
Uh, and, you know, some people may look at this and say, oh, this isn't the best way to create it. And, and there may be better ways. Uh, we're not, you know, our goal is to make it work. Uh, not necessarily, you know, we will come back and maybe do it more optimally uh, as as we as we can, but to get this thing to work the first time. So, you know, you do your thing, you do the typical thing where you're installing the packages with TL Manager by hand. You know, there's the install config file, the tech live profile that, you know, tells us, you know, how this thing's going to get installed and the different options, you know, collection basic, you know, what our, what our target binary is on the back end for Amazon, you know, all the, all the things that, that you need for that. And then in the Docker file, you know, all these different repositories that all these different packages that, okay, we think we need this thing. Okay. Let's run a file. Can we actually typeset something? Uh, and uh, you know, you go on, you remove the large files, the stuff you don't need, and then I will come to this and, and elaborate on this in just a second. Well, one is we are using Lua LaTeX because of Unicode, which I'll show on my one of my next slides. But the other thing that we did that really helped actually sort of get things going, and this is what I mean when I say prime the pump in the Docker file. We copy a sample tech file over, and you know we actually typeset that on the Docker container uh, in the Docker file. So what that does, and the reason we did that was, even though we installed all these packages that we needed, uh, and probably more that we don't need, but we installed you know all those packages, but we would still have issues. And the issues came about when we went to Lua LaTeX because of Unicode. But if we run Lua LaTeX once on a representative sample tech file, uh, that caused the container to do its things with fonts and mappings and the magic that happens on the first run of a tech file. Uh, and that was the kind of the key thing to get us over the hump on the deployment you know, if we wanted to use Lua LaTeX and not PDF LaTeX because of what these protocol documents look like. Um, so so this is one of the, the key things that we found at least is in the tail end of the Docker file, process a, process a file, you know, process a tech file. And if your container works, you'll get a PDF, you know, from that and initialize and make the system go through and typeset all the characters and, and do all the magic. And folks on the call probably know, can tell me what that magic is. But to us, it's like, you know, if we run this thing, then it actually works. Um, so let me see what the next slide is. Yeah, so, so the next slide is just reporting that, you know, run the, at the tail end of the Docker file, run LaTeX, let it do its thing, and then your container's, you know, pretty close to working. We did not have this issue with the PDF LaTeX, but we did with Lua. Um, uh, but Lua actually typesets all the crazy Unicode characters that exist in protocol documents. Um, okay. Yeah, and talking about more challenges, Unicode, 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 Unicode. Um, so here's here's just a snippet of one of these protocol documents. And, and if you think about it from a typesetting point of view, and so this is this is what exists. This is verbatim. Just <laughs> so uh, platelets greater than or equal. Okay, well there's a nice Unicode. Whoops, go back. There's a nice Unicode character, less than or equal. Uh, down here, there's a beta. There's all kinds of Greek letters uh, that you find in these things. There's circle ones and circle twos and all kinds of um, you know, Unicode characters that just exist. These protocol documents are sourced from many different kinds of sources of authorship. There's not a single system that you go use to create your protocol document. Um, they, they come from all over the place. They have 
Some of the encodings are, you know, traditional 8-bit encodings. Some of these, like this one, uh, they, they are Unicode encodings. So you've got less than, you know, the different less than or greater than signs. You'll find exponents. Um, you'll find mistypings of exponents and, and uh, you know, math things that make you cringe in a protocol document. But uh, nevertheless, this is what you see. So, and if we, we go look at clinicaltrials.gov, this is a real trial. So if we go look at clinicaltrials.gov, and we see what this, I just picked one at random. So this is Gilteranib versus Midostarin in FLT3 mutated acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, and it is still recruiting. The last update was July the 5th. Um, and then you see some of the text, you know, and you will see up there, there, there's a nice exponent that you'll see. There's greater than or equal to. And so, so these are the sorts of things. So it's a very sort of unpredictable set of things that come in. Um, and it's very, um, from a from my typesetting standpoint, it's like, well, what do we do with these things? We got to make sure we've got the mappings right that we you know, the greater than or equal to sign is really a greater than or equal to sign when it gets typeset, um, it, so on and so forth. So if we look at that sample.tech file that we talked about before, you know, if we look at the kinds of things that we pass through in this thing, there, we just made typed every Greek letter, or at least hopefully we covered most of the Greek letters. It's like whatever font set this thing's coming from, we want all those letters in there because there's a ton of Greek letters in our protocol documents. Um, we wanted to make sure that some of these circled things actually work. And when we typeset them and we have some with the glyphs, we do some um, substitutions. But but you know, just typeset this thing. You know, just simply typeset this tech document that you know we all know and love. What tech? What a law tech document looks like. Just typeset this thing. So this jump starts the process, primes the pump, and then all of the you know all the subsequent subsequent things that we do, uh, they they work okay. Okay, I should hurry along here, and. Let's actually do a, a very quick demo because I am at running out of time here. So let's actually log in. Oops. Ready to go. Hang on. So we're logging into MFACT and I will do a search and generate a law tech report if the gods are smiling. So if all this stuff that I say works, works. So let's do mail, let's do 33. I wished I was 33. 68124, I have not had chemotherapy. I have had prior radiotherapy. I've had prior surgery. Let's say I've been treated with nivolumab. Uh, we're gonna do lung cancer. And we'll do non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, get, you know, so if you're the NCIT that I talked about before, this this is one of the things that we use that comes from there a graphical representation of the diseases in a you know it's a the hierarchy rolled out in a tree form so we've got that we'll say we're EGFR positive for biomarkers I uh, we'll we'll say I do not have brain mints and we'll just leave it at that for now and now. The computation, the back end engine is actually doing its thing. 
um, creating the match matrix um, for non-small cell lung cancer uh, with the parameters that I put in. So here in a few seconds, hopefully, there we go. We've got 93 trials that we've matched to. You know, and it tells us the kind of matches do we match for biomarkers. So all that computation, those 6,000 transitive closure operations that occurred, you know, as we were watching it. And let's say uh, I can drive 50 miles because I know that will narrow it down considerably. And we're down to six and we should be able to generate, uh, include all matching trials. And it should show up here in a minute in our downloads. Oop, it did on my other screen. But here's our LaTeX file. And this is our typeset file. So all of that machinery that we had uh, wow. works. You know, and so um, yeah, we, the indexers are there, the wow. table of contents, the thing that, uh, you know, all the things that one would expect in a typeset uh, LaTeX file. So I know I'm at, right at the end of time, but if there's any questions, um, uh, feel free to ask. Mm. Very nice talk, Robert. Very intricate. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. It, it is a interesting and non-trivial uh, you know, uh, area of work, but you know, in, in terms of sort of a novel application of seeing where you know, law tech shows up, um, you know, it works and it works well, typesets well, and deploys well. All of those things um, that we need uh, to produce a a nice PDF document uh, as we need it. So. Um, somebody is raising a hand. Yeah. Yes, it's me. <laughs> As you are handling medical data, uh, Hubert, don't we have uh, privacy concerns? Huh? For example, you have to use special options for AWS. Huh? Uh, I didn't hear that, so. Really slowly, on... slowly, Jeremy. Yes, sir. As you're handling medical data, don't you have privacy concerns? Huh? For example, do you have to use special options uh, to be allowed to use AWS? Huh? Yeah, I, I, can you type the question out? I can't, um, um, or could... My hearing is not the greatest on good days. So, you know, it's... Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so let's see the question. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, there, there are privacy concerns. You know, this is, you know, we, we are in demonstration mode. Um, but if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, uh, and other tools, they will let you do it. Now, how much of the data gets retained? What do we do with that data? Uh, you, you know, all has to follow, all has to follow rules, but, um, you know, there's, but there are, there are concerns there. And, you know, how you address those concerns, a lot of it is how the things are set up, you know, what the security is like, you know, is the data encrypted at rest? And then, you know, you know, do you retain data? You know, there's options to say, you know, do you save, do you save data or not? Do you allow people to mark clinical trials or not? What kind of things do you do? But, you know, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov and you go to some of the other search tools, you know, they, they will do much the same thing. So, and then the other question, do you have to use special options to be, allowed to use AWS. And I don't know if that's in particular about law tech or just medical uh, stuff in general. You know, we aren't collecting 
all of the information, um, you know, with the patient. So there's there's security issues there. If you're asking about LaTeX, then you know, yeah, we had to do quite a bit of work to make the thing work on AWS and and generate this document. You know, there's other things like logging of searches and that sort of thing. You know, we're not we're not a patient care system, so there are a number of these open tools that you can go use to search on clinical trials today. Ours is in beta, you know, behind a login uh, right now. So you have to have an account to use it. Uh, but there are a number of these tools that are open that do the same sorts of job. Now, if you're in a space where you're interacting a little more, you know, detailed, uh, then, you know, there's, you know, the more you interact with an electronic record, the more you have to be careful with what you do with it. But, you know, we we do not, you know, we want to strike, you know, there's a balance between making it convenient and easy to use and, you know, make it so that you can pick your data and then what we do with the data, you know, how it's handled in the back end, how we address those issues. You know, th those are all security concerns, absolutely, because, you know, the you do not want your medical information, you know, you know, published somebody to go download your medical information, you know, so um, that's not authorized to to use it. And so that, you know, so the security concerns are there, you know, there's ways to get around it, to run it in a secure space, to run it, you know, to plays by all the rules that we're supposed to play by, so. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Herbert. Uh, beautiful presentation and. Uh... You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Okay.